Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So welcome to The No Show, Jim. I'm, I'm really pleased to have you. Um, you, you mentioned just before we started recording, you've, you've had a, an exhausting time with this, with this um, lockdown period. Well, I mean, exhausting, exhausting in terms of looking at the screen all the time, isn't it? That's the, that's yeah, the exactly. Yeah. It was good at first. I was quite happy to be working from home. But then as people got the hang of uh, inviting you onto Zooms and it just got more and more and more, that was exhausting. But no, thanks very much for having me on. This sounds a great, great uh, initiative you've got going there. Oh, it's, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, so l let's start a bit, a, bit, a bit about your background. So, so um, what led you down the route where you're currently studying or taking, um, I guess, um, inquiring into, into yoga. Um, how did you find yourself on this path? Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you the, short, the short version because the long version could take up the whole podcast. But the uh, <laughs> short version is through various, for various reasons. I, I started studying Sanskrit, so the classical language of India, as an undergrad from the age of uh, 18 or whatever. And then, and I was spending quite a lot of time in India and I got very interested in the whole sort of wandering yogi, ascetic, sadhu uh, mm. lifestyle, I suppose you would call it, in, in India. Spent a lot of time living with those, uh, those sort of uh, religious practitioners. And I then I did an MA in anthropology, but I kind of decided that anthropology wasn't really my cup of tea, a bit too much theory going on for me. And it was sort of seemed to be getting in the way of... Uh, the subject I wanted to study so I thought I'd go back to my Sanskrit training for my PhD so I had to look for a Sanskrit text that was relevant to that world that I was interested in mm -hmm. uh, yeah and the only ones really of any direct relevance were the ones on yoga and in particular what they call Hatha yoga physical yoga mm -hmm. so I chose a text uh, about this very kind of esoteric yogic technique where you stick your tongue up above your palate and uh, in order to drink the nectar of immortality that's coming down from the top of your, your skull uh, and I so I did I did a critical edition of that for my PhD which involved getting all the manuscripts of that text I could find comparing them working out what I thought was the earliest reconstructable version and also doing lots of field work in India trying to find practitioners of that practice uh, and by the time I got to the end of the PhD I kind of realized that the received history of yoga, and I generally focus on the kind of more physical manifestations of yoga, but the received history of that really didn't match what I was seeing in manuscripts and also my fieldwork in India. So I realized that, and, and, and that one of the reasons for that is because there had been no serious scholarship on the subject, on the historical aspects of it in particular. Uh, I mean, mainly because I think I, unusual combination in that I'm prepared to you know spend hours going through manuscripts and going through the nitty-gritty of variant readings and, and and so forth and I'm interested in this not particularly intellectual tradition you know normally my colleagues or in, or historically people have been into Sanskrit manuscripts and so forth have studied you know philosophy or linguistics mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of thing so it's quite unusual to be a what we call a philologist, you know, someone who works with manuscripts and so forth to study something that is, in fact, intellectually not that sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I then, at the end of the PhD, I realised that, you know, in order to really get to the bottom of this, get to understand the, the full picture of the history of yoga, I'd need to look at, you know, look at all the texts available, reassess all the information that was out there. Um, and but I, I didn't I had a slightly sort of roundabout academic career because I after my PhD I ended up working for a, a translation project, a private translation project, mm -hmm. Sanskrit poetry. I did that for about I think it was six or seven years. But at the same time, that was very flexible and that gave me, gave me the time. Also, I was able to you know spend half the year in India, 
uh, gather more manuscripts and work away on the side at my, of, on my kind of interest in this history of yoga. And then when that project finished and I was kind of scrabbling around, wondering what the hell to do next, it took me a few years. I, I, I landed after four or five years, I got the job at SOAS where I got the, the Sanskrit position. <clears throat> and one of the first things I did was put together an application to the ERC, the European Research Council, for this, a, a big research project basically looking into the, the history of uh, mm. yoga practice through its texts. So we're, we're going to produce 10 critical editions of important texts for the history of yoga and also through field work in India, um, you know, spent amongst traditional practitioners of yoga. So that's that's what we've been doing. We're getting near the end of the five years. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been excellent. We've kind of, you know, my, my dream has come true. We have I think we've really been able to, um, you know, work out in much more definition, create much better understanding of the development of yoga over the last thousand years. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a really sort of interesting uh, sequence of 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 events. Um, but I want to start off uh, earlier on. So so why why did you choose Sanskrit? Like what 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 was it about Sanskrit that that made that fascinated you? What a bit more of the long story. Okay. Well, to be honest, I mean it was kind of so. What? Yeah. Well, I. A levels, I did double mass physics and Latin, and I didn't want to carry on with any of them. <laughs> I was kind of slightly delighted. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I was kind of physics was what I was best at, but I really wasn't that keen to carry on with it. I think it's sometimes it's something to do with the relationship with your teachers, isn't it? And I, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. But Latin was okay, but I couldn't really carry on with classics because I hadn't done Greek. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but I was a good student. I mean, I wasn't particularly dedicated but I got good results mm -hmm. and so it was fairly likely I'd be able to go to Oxford or Cambridge I wanted to go to Oxford read the prospectus went you know it's going through the prospectus turning the page oh no I don't want to do that don't want to do that don't want to do that got to oriental studies and thought oh yeah maybe you know this that could, could be for me uh, but the main the main subject was Chinese I went to Oxford for an open day and the Chinese professor was giving the talk you know to all the assembled prospective oriental studies students and it was a very uninspiring talk <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a four-year course and I was sitting there thinking god no god, I'm not sure I can cope with this for four years uh, and at the end of his talk he said uh, if anyone's interested in Sanskrit the Sanskrit professor is in his study at the end of the corridor and I'd vaguely heard of Sanskrit and I in fact a friend of mine had been he was a couple of years older than me and he had been travelled in India worked in India on his gap year between between school and Oxford and come back and told me great stories about what an amazing time he'd had mm -hmm. so I kind of two and two together there but anyway I went went down the corridor and there were there were two two men in there where one was the professor of Sanskrit at the time and then the, at the time the other guy was the lecturer in Sanskrit um, and they I can't actually remember how the conversation went but I came out of it thinking yeah this this is this sounds like it could be for me and it, it so it turned out in the end that the 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 other guy the the lecturer was he was called or is called Alexis Sanderson and he then ended up being my you know PhD supervisor and so okay very lucky to you know he was very lucky to end up working with him because he's a kind of you know leading light in our subject and mm -hmm. so when I ended up back in Oxford in 95 it was when I started my PhD he had a you know bunch of students around him and colleagues. It was an amazing you know with high, you don't really realise at the time, but with hindsight looking back, it was like a sort of golden age for our subject. He had loads of brilliant students around him. It was a really great atmosphere, and so they you know that was what encouraged me to get into this uh, the editing of texts, you know, gathering manuscripts and going through the manuscripts. And they were all doing the same thing. So it was a really kind of collaborative, you know, supportive network. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That's a, that's a sort of int interesting backstory to get into, and and it's also the fact that um, a person can be, you know, the the spark that gets you involved in a subject that you find yourself in, uh, you know, like how however many years later, it's it's really interesting. Yeah. And the other, well, the fun, other funny thing about it is the guy. I say so when I I went off to India after school, I worked in London for a few months, and then went off for six or seven months with a with another friend from school, Alex Watson. And he he's now professor of Indian philosophy at Ashoka University in Delhi. Okay. So it ruined both our lives. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it sounds it sounds like it's it's definitely a journey. Um, so it's a really um unusual journey when you're when you're kind of thinking about a, a subject um as old as Sanskrit. And so I, I want to ask your research or or this um the work that you've ended up doing. Would you say it's it's um still is still in its infancy or is it just a transitional period where you're translating it into English? No, I uh, I'd say when I mean, it's it it's in, particularly the the period that I focus on in our project. So there's four of us in the in the project that I'm running at the moment, and I work primarily on the early texts of physical yoga, so 11th to 15th century or so. And in fact, we've covered in terms of the Sanskrit texts, we've covered pretty much all of them. There are very few gaps. There are very very few texts now that if any that uh, you know there are no texts that i that i'm thinking God, if only we could find a manuscript of that or something mm -hmm. so to some extent what, what what i have realized in the course of the project is that there are vernacular texts so sanskrit's like the kind of educated highbrow language of india it's a bit like has the same similar position to latin say in medieval europe uh, but then of course there are all the vernacular more you know spoken languages and there are texts in some of those languages that i've now realized are important for the early history but yeah, I sometimes think, you know, I think to some extent I need to, uh, you know, move on to something else because I have answered most of my questions. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe that's just me. You know, maybe I'm, I mean, I'm sure other, you know, what, what we're going to do at the end of this project, we're going to produce editions and translations of the 10 of, 10 of the most important texts of chart mapping the, the history of yoga over the last thousand years. And then people will, other scholars will be able to ask all sorts of questions of them. You know, there were lots of aspects of of the practices and of the history that perhaps I'm not interested in that other people will be, that they'll then be able to draw on from that. But I've kind of, yeah, for me, to some extent, I've answered, you know, I've answered the big questions, which I guess is a good thing. You know, that's what the project mm. had to do. And we've, uh, yeah, we've done And it. so the, the time period that you're looking at for, for yoga, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm per, like personally very interested to know, um, how far removed is our understanding of yoga now just in on a commercial level um from that what what yoga looked like in that time period according to to your your research yeah well that was you know that was it was very different to be honest and that was something that, that bothered me troubled me for a long time you know because i i from i'm quite unusual amongst my colleagues you know yoga studies has now become quite a thing there are lots of different aspects of it as well you know, just for example yesterday there was a big uh virtual conference based in la i think it was where colleagues you know colleagues and friends were involved but it's not 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 my cup of tea because I, I don't look so much at the modern manifestations of it in the west but there was a big conference on abuse in yoga you know because mm -hmm. there's scandals about various yoga organizations where the teachers have, have uh, been abusing their students and so forth oh, on, on netflix they have that documentary right um, yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, exactly um what's his name bikram yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. horrible horrible guy um so yeah so i don't work so much on that and and i so i've come at the subject from a different route from most of my colleagues a lot of my colleagues you know got into yoga basically got into practicing yoga in a yoga studio in london or wherever and then got into yoga that way i got into it through hanging out in india with you know with these sadhus and holy men who also happen to be practitioners of yoga and I, for a long time i couldn't really understand the the disconnect between that world in which you know, to a great extent, the physical practice is seen as secondary. You mm -hmm. know, ultimately, it's a spiritual practice. All the physical things are preparing you for meditative techniques in order to try and merge yourself with the divine or however you understand that. Um, and also, it's very much historically, it's always been very much practiced only by kind of professionals, you know, religious professionals who renounce normal worldly life. They don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. They beg for their... I say beg, they, they, they don't actively beg normally, you know, the, the pucker good ones are, are given stuff by the lay disciples and so forth. But it, it operates in a very different social sphere as well. And there's not this idea that everyone should and can do yoga. It's very much a kind of a choice. And then it becomes the, you know, the, the main thing of, of the, the, the main purpose of, of your lifestyle. So it wasn't until in fact, 2009 2010 my colleague mark singleton who i work with on this project mm -hmm. he wrote a great book called yoga body 
and that really explains how you know yoga took hold and then kind of changed in the west over the 20th century in particular and then i mean he actually kind of needs updating and there's lots of people working on this because then it's taken on another whole life of its own over the last 30 years in the 90s it really took another turn i think um when it became you know it became sort of repackaged but before you know when i first started studying it it was still kind of hippie-ish still slightly alternative you know and then over the course of the 90s it be became repackaged as you know something you go to your yoga studio um, so yeah you you were saying um that it went through some sort of um how how yoga has been in in the west that went through some kind of evolution yeah it's so i it was it was always you know confusing for me because the yoga that i was seeing practiced and the the, the way it worked in society in india was very different from what I saw in the West, and I hadn't, I, yeah, I didn't engage much with what was going on in the West. I think I've been to two two yoga classes in my life. I spent a lot of time, as I say, with traditional yogis in India, and I've learned yoga from them. Uh, so that the the disconnect was pretty confusing. And then it wasn't until I read my colleague uh, Mark Singleton's book called Yoga Body, which he published in two thousand and ten, uh, which basically you know explores the history, the development of yoga over the twentieth century. Up to, I mean, it doesn't bring it completely up to date because I think we then see from the mid 90s onwards, uh, there's, a, there's another kind of big change in, in yoga and the way it's practiced, in that it goes from being something that's still a bit kind of alternative, you know, a bit hippie ish perhaps. Certainly when I started getting interested in it in the late 80s, I suppose, uh, it was still seen as a kind of fringe alternative lifestyle practice. But then in the 90s, it gets sort of repackaged as something that you can just do for an hour or two in your yoga class each week and that will make you better equipped to be a more sort of productive uh, worker you know and it becomes mm. because it's it developed in india out of a uh, it, out of a culture which rejects kind of productivity and materialism and so forth it's a sort of radical way of of looking at the purpose of existence and so it's been kind of flipped on its head to some extent in the West. And I said, when I say in the West, then it's come back into India as well. You know, there's a constant sort of circle of ideas because the way it's developed in the West and in India has been feeding into each other over the last hundred years. Um, what I should say, and as Mark makes clear in his book, is that the, um, the in the, hang on, I just said my wife's coming up and told her I'm doing a podcast. Hey, John. Um, uh so yeah what was i saying over yeah so a really important um phase of development in the in the history of yoga and it's in its trance it's it's, it's becoming a, a global phenomenon was through the work of a yoga teacher in south india in the early 20th century called t krishnamacharya who was then the the guru the teacher to three of the most uh, influential uh, uh, yoga teachers who are mo most influential in, in transmitting it to the West, in particular BKS Iyengar and uh, Patabi Joyce, and then there's uh, Desika Chah. So these three students were really kind of key to this uh, the transmission of, 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 of yoga to the West. And what Krishnamacharya did that was so brilliant and timely, you know, he, he became an active participant in this kind of global health culture that was developing in the early 20th century you know in the west we have so for example mr kellogg of kellogg's you know he was a kind of prime movement health spas and so forth and yeah. these you know new uh, well uh, it was a, quite a surprise to me to learn that um you know until the late 19th early 20th century people really didn't weren't that into exercise or anything like that you know physical development cultivate looking after yourself apart from you know very much sort of specialist sort of uh, wrestlers and things like that people weren't really doing much in the way of physical cultivation and then it becomes a thing from basically in, uh, most significantly from the early 20th century onwards and what krishnamacharya did was he built on traditional yoga practice but he then incorporated other things that were part of this global movement you know like um for example sort of uh, is it 
Swedish gymnastics as a, a guy called Ling, who was very influential in the uh, development and promotion of gymnastics in the early 20th century. Uh, some American techniques of bodybuilding, we can see those being drawn in. And then even it seems quite likely that he was looking at the military drills of some of the British soldiers in South yeah. India at this time as well, and incorporating that into the practice of yoga. Because we see, you know, there are a lot of the, a lot of the physical methods or physical uh, techniques that, that we see now, we don't have any evidence for in pre-modern texts, mm -hmm. particular sort of standing postures and so forth. And, and also linked, you know, complicated linked dynamic sequences of movements we don't really find either. Um, you know, the, the postures in pre-modern texts, and not just in the text, but we know from travellers' reports and so forth, were generally to be held for long periods of time. You know, it's not this kind of dynamic, flowing, mm -hmm. keep fit type thing. But having said that, one of the things we have found in, in the project is that there is, you know, prior to any engagement with uh countries outside of india there is we do see a kind of uh, a shift in focus we do see some incorporation of dynamic movement there's more emphasis on the postures as well even within india itself so i'm talking about sort of 17th 18th century texts there is this sort of growing emphasis on the physical side of it there too which I, we can't put down you know People, people think that Mark, for example, Mark, my colleague, his book where he points out that Krishnamacharya had these influences such as, you know, from the Swedish gymnastics and so forth. People then, you know, the sound bite of that, the way it gets distilled down is that, oh, you know, um, everything that's now taught as yoga is a modern invention. That's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the, another angle, another way it's looked at is to say that, you know, every, that yoga is basically comes from western physical techniques that's not true either you know it's a it's a, a a mixture of all kinds of influences and we do see that the emphasis on you know again people not just in the west but people in india will say oh you know there's this uh, unwarranted uh, emphasis on physical practice in yoga when it should be about meditating and achieving spiritual aims and so forth but we do see in the indian tradition as well uh, prior to any engagement with the west an increased emphasis on on physical methods there too. Why that should be, I'm I, I don't don't have an answer to that question. Mm. But yeah, uh, that's uh, so. You, I want to go back to the point where you mentioned how um, basically the the ideas of the West and 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 the ideas of of the East or India feed into one another. And so, based on sort of these developments that happened. Um, with the incorporation of whether it's Swedish gymnastics or, or military drills, has that impacted how the yogis in India um, practice their yoga? Yes, that's a good question. Yeah, and uh, so I'll start that again. With bang from there. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a good question. And in fact, when I got shortlisted for this big grant for the project that I'm running, I had an interview in Brussels, and I had to go out there. Hang on, sorry. Can you hear the no, 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 you're right. You're right. Just, okay, just keep going. It, it sounds right. Great. Okay. So, yeah, when I got shortlisted for this big grant that, that ended up funding the project, I had to go out to Brussels for an interview. And one of the things, I was only allowed to prepare a seven-minute, you know, little uh, presentation. And one of the, the pictures I showed, I only showed about five pictures, was, was of this, this yogi, this young yogi that I'd met um, called uh, Anupnath, calls himself uh, Hatha Yogi Baba. Uh, quite a, quite a character and I'd met him um, 2011 and I met him a few times afterwards and he in his yoga routine that he, he did all these postures that you know there are no pre-modern precedents for in India and I remember asking the first time I met him I was like oh my god this is you know it's kind of when I saw him do this display of postures it slightly you know blew apart various ideas and you know, theories in fact I was writing a paper on how uh, the kind of traditional ascetics, traditional yogis of India didn't do this sort of yoga practice. I was like, oh my God, this is all falling apart in front of me. And at the end of it, I said to him, I said, look, how, um, you know, where did you learn these, these, these postures from? And he said, oh, they came to me directly from Guru Goraknath, who's like the 12th century founder of his mm -hmm. sect. And in fact, you know, I got to know him and he's pretty handy on a smartphone. He's quite good on the cell phone. Okay. He's got 5,000 followers on Facebook or whatever. And he clearly, I think, was learning these postures from looking online and so forth. And in mm. fact, I showed one of them. I remember showing one a picture 
to Mark single to my colleague and he was like oh that's that's from the third series of the Ashtanga yoga that was developed by Patabi Joyce in the 20th century okay so that so I used that when I went for my interview to say look we need to do the field work now we need to get in there because this 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 is changing fast you know the, mm. you know, the traditional yogis of India are now incorporating uh, non-traditional elements into their practice having said that he this guy Anupnath is quite unusual and I'd say that most still most of the traditional ascetics that I hang out with you know that I've spent years living with they don't do the modern stuff and they do draw a distinction in fact between what they do which they call yoga okay so yoga is a Sanskrit word but when you in the vernaculars so in Hindi I you know I, I speak Hindi so I'm normally speaking in in, in Hindi to the, my sadhu friends and uh, acquaintances in India so they will talk about yoga, that what they do is yoga, but they're aware, very much aware of this phenomenon called yoga, which is okay. in studios, you know, in cities in India and then around the world and so forth. And they make, they make a distinction between their yoga and then the yoga, which is just for kind of worldly people. It's, you know, they say it's just like gymnastics. And, you know, in, uh, and so has that distinction always been there, the, uh, yoga and, and yoga? Well, I, I, I only became apparent to me, you know, in the probably in the last decade or two mm -hmm. i mean i think it's no it's probably only the last sort of 20 30 years during which yoga has become such a huge global phenomenon that the sadhus of, of, of you know the sadhus the holy men the religious practitioners in india are aware of this to some extent they're capitalizing on it as well you know there are so there are now sects that are so the, this guy anupnath who i mentioned this remarkably kind of bendy contortionist yogi who does all these uh, postures both traditional and modern that he's learned online or whatever uh he is now well he was i don't know it was three or four years ago went to one of these big festivals uh, the kumbh mela festivals in india where you get you know tens of millions of people coming and he would perform in his sects camp each day he would do a kind of public display of all the postures even and that is a new very much a new thing you know so the in the you know now the 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 sadhus in india they are aware of the uh you know what a, a popular thing yoga has become around the world and in india amongst kind of non you know non religious professionals so they are now using that and incorporating it into their practices more in order to promote their own sex if, if, if you see what i mean mm -hmm. you know, that, that's definitely a new development you I've, ne I've been going to this festival since 92 and you've never seen that before and now they're kind of pushing there uh, so, so essentially it's, it's all also been used um what i understand from you is that it's been used by the the yogis um or certain yogis to essentially marketize themselves to some extent yeah 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 i mean obviously you know that's these they the the religious sects as i said earlier they you know they're not allowed to work for a living they, you know they've given mm -hmm. so they they to a great extent exist uh, or get by through charity um of course they amass property and stuff over time so they you know they uh, they can they get income from that and so forth but yeah there's they they live and survive through the uh the donations from their lay followers yeah so anything they can do to attract more lay followers is is useful to them yeah mm -hmm. and so so i i guess in that in that in that sense, it, it's not too dissimilar to any sort of religion around the world. No, no, and then they're competing to some extent. You know, they're, so you could, they're competing amongst themselves. There are different sects among themselves, and then even within one sect, you know, different charismatic holy men and women will be, you know, vying with each other. And then, of course, they're, you know, the so the the people that I spend time with, live with, and done my field work with, whatever these yoga practitioners, they are. They're kind of separate from the priests, the, the Brahmins, the pundits who work in the temples and so forth. That's another different area. So to some extent, they're in competition as well because they're all competing for the, uh, you know, the the attention of the of the lay mm -hmm. non-religious specialists. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it sounds sounds like it's just an evolution that it seems to be happening across. You know, all. Yeah, sort of it's not a new thing though. It's not a new. I mean, there's a there's a good story in the the Pali Canon, you know, which is the story of the as tales of the of the Buddha. 
you know, so we're looking at mm. nearly two and a half thousand years ago. And there's a funny one where he, so he, that, that is the time basically when yoga really starts developing, you know, becomes, uh, becomes a thing, you know, we get traces of it prior to that, but it's, that's the time when the kind of sects of yogis start uh, really developing the, the basic principles. And there's a story where he's, uh, he, you know, he tries everything. There's this really kind of vibrant culture in the it's kind of North India, just on the border with Nepal, a region called Magadha. And that's where he lived. And he is traveling around, you know, he's trying everything that all these different religious practitioners, there's lots of new ideas, new practices being developed. So he falls in with various different groups and he's wandering around with one group uh, one day and they get near Varanasi. So Banaras, you know, the ancient city in uh, northern, in northern India. And they, somehow they know that the king's around or the king is coming. So the leader of the, the troops says, right, guys, um, you know, you all need to assume your positions here. You, you do your standing thing there and you do that special penance where you're surrounded by fires and you, you chant some, some texts, you know, do chant some sacred texts because then we might... Um, attract the king and if we can get the king's attention he likes what we're doing then we'll be we'll be sorted out for good you know he'll give yeah 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 so it's not yeah no, i'm not saying it's kind of turned you know the buddha's being slightly cynical in this of course you know because perhaps he you know there's always been a there can be a well nice no, not always because the texts themselves generally say and in fact also in my experience of serious yoga practitioners in india they do it in secret, in secluded places, in mm -hmm. huts, you know, away from society. But at the same time, there can always be quite a performative element to it, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it is sometimes used like that, particularly at these festivals and so forth. To, to yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I suppose it's very hard to distinguish between what's choreographed and what's genuinely a spiritual experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I, and, I, often, I, and, and again, also, like, as, you know, with that, with the guys saying about Anupnath, you know, I don't know to what extent it's him wanting to do it in public or whether, you know, it's the more senior people in his set saying, right, no, we're going to put you there because mm. we think that will attract patrons. Yeah, yeah. And, and that would that would sort of make sense to ask that question, because uh, ultimately there there are goals that have to be met. Yeah, yeah, they need to. They, need, they do they still need to eat, you know. Um, so I, I want to ask, so you said you've answered the big questions that um, generally you had in this, in this research. So what are some of the big questions that you did have? Okay, have I, what are the big questions? So, hang on, sorry, let's turn off. So I put my email back on, I'll turn it back off. So it um, the, the big questions really were where it, came from where physical yoga practice came from and mm -hmm. how and why it got recorded in texts mm -hmm. and i've changed you know that it's exciting thing i've had to change you know revise my understanding of lots of different things which i think is clearly you know that's a, a good sign that we're, we're doing productive work in the project um one of the things i used to think was that all these physical practices that we find written down in texts only from about a thousand years ago i used to think well they've been going on for a much longer since the time of the buddha i don't think that anymore i think you know from it's really quite clear now that about a thousand years ago in india a bunch of new ideas and new practices uh developed okay which we mm -hmm. don't have any real precedence for this i think it's fairly clear that there's some influence of some mutual uh uh, you know, cross fertilization with Taoist traditions in China. Mm -hmm. but again, I'm no specialist in that. Um, and I think that, you know, that would require a whole new research project to understand what was going on then. But yeah, there's the, all these ideas that, as I say, only appear about a thousand years ago and the practices only appear then. Um, the very first, one of our biggest, you know, for me, the most exciting discovery has then. Uh, kind of steered my research as a result since, it was fairly early on in the project, there's a text I've been working on called the Amrita Siddhi, which is the earliest text, the first text to teach any of the practices and principles of physical yoga. And it's about a thousand years old. I'd been working from relatively late Indian manuscripts, probably 18th century. But I, you know, I'd looked at it a bit before, but then we got hold of a, a 12th century manuscript that was in Beijing. It's probably gone back to Tibet. It's bilingual Sanskrit and Tibetan. And working closely on that with a colleague in Oxford, it slowly became clear to us that the text was written by Buddhists, not Hindus. Okay. So that was a big surprise. Because mm -hmm. everyone's just, well, you know, the kind of received 
you know, traditional Hindu narrative, of course, is that yoga has been around for 5,000 years and hasn't changed and was, you know, revealed perfectly 5,000 years ago. I mean, I knew that wasn't, that wasn't right, but I had assumed that it had come out of, that it had been a development, development out of Hindu tantric traditions. But what is clear now, and what, as I say, a lot of my work recently has been trying to make more sense of, is that the first text to write down these physical yoga practices was written by Buddhists, tantric Buddhists. And they were closely related, you know, they interacted with the Hindus, but uh, it's clearly them who wrote it down. And a lot of the terminology that they developed has then stuck around, you know, was then used, because that's the, that's the only one of the texts of the physical yoga traditions that was written by Buddhists, but it then gets borrowed from and reworked and adapted by lots of subsequent Hindu traditions oh, right. there composing their texts yeah i thought i thought that might get me in trouble you know i thought people might not <laughs> like that but no one seems to pay much attention yet uh, so so, <laughs> so the, is that the earliest text that you you could you know of or, or, or it, yeah it, that we're working on in this project yeah but i'm very confident that it's the earliest text on physical yoga because it's you can kind of yeah for various reasons it introduces loads of things that we don't find in any text previously and it then becomes a kind of source root text. Oh, okay, so okay. To, to work from. Yeah. And it's very interesting you mentioned the fact that it's, it's actually developed by, oh, it was written by Buddhists. Yeah. Which is, um, so like, like you mentioned, it's, it's, it could get you in, in some trouble with, with some people, but I mean, is that not what research is there for? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm not keeping it quiet and I haven't, been, I mean, I haven't been really shouting about it. I haven't been trying to rub it in people's faces or anything, but, um, I mean, having an, on a, you know, that uh, one of the, so one of the key texts that we work with, uh, in fact, I've been I'm trying to finish off the edition at the moment, uh, is called the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra, which means the yoga treatise, the yoga teachings of uh, Dattatreya, who's a kind of divine yogi. And that was probably written 12th or 13th century. And that has this great uh, verse in it, which I often quote, which says, uh, in fact, I, I tweeted about it the other day because apparently the Greek Orthodox Church had come out saying that you mustn't do yoga, you know, good Christians mustn't do yoga. Because this verse says anyone can do yoga. And if you practice, you can get success, you can, you can get benefits or progress in your spiritual path, whether you're a, a Buddhist, uh, you know, one of these sort of weird skull-bearing tantrics of Brahmin, uh, even an atheist, what they call a charvaka, which is like a materialist atheist. Mm -hmm. So it's basically saying anyone can benefit from practicing yoga. Um, so yeah, that's that that's pretty clear. Uh, one of the other things we've looked at very closely uh, in the in the project is um, one of the manuscripts we've been working with teaches a bunch of postures, which are also only we only found elsewhere in this Persian text that was composed in around 1550. Mm. And then um, uh, Prince Salim, who went on to become the emperor, the Mughal emperor Jahangir, mm. he uh, commissioned a um, illustrated manuscript of it in 1602. And this was, it's been on, put on show in a couple of exhibitions and stuff. It's now in the, um, in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. But that is, it's got these great, um, paintings of yogis doing various yoga practices and it's you know it's, it's but the, the text itself is called the bar al khayat which means the the ocean of life or something like that the waters of life my version's not great excuse me pronunciation was probably bad as well but what's fascinating about that is that the text in itself was written about 1550 and it's kind of islamic reframing of yoga traditions okay the manuscript the manuscript produced for prince salim is our earliest illustrated manuscript of yoga postures you know and apparently it's still the the text itself as well is still current among sufi traditions throughout uh uh northern northern africa in particular like morocco algeria around there i'm told you know i'm no expert in this but colleagues who are um so yeah the uh we see this very kind of um you know, ecumenical approach, uh, understanding of yoga, that yoga is something that can be done uh, and can benefit anyone. Um, and that's also reflected in the texts that I've been working on, in that they're produced by very different Hindu religious traditions. Mm -hmm. After we get, this, we get this Buddhist text a thousand years ago, but then the subsequent texts on physical yoga are produced by very different uh, 
religious traditions in India, you know, they have quite, you know, what some are dualists. So, you know, some believe that, you know, God and the practitioner are separate, you know, that, and that's a big difference between those who are monist, you know, who think that all is one and so forth. And various different philosophical traditions produce their own texts on yoga. So they're all, you know, they all think that yoga is, is a is a good thing to be practiced and people you know there's the kind of there's the, the old uh, perennial philosophy idea that the paths are many and the goal is one mm-hmm. and in fact what uh I, I like to flip that around and in fact when we look at the yoga traditions in india it's like the the path is one you know they say everyone should do yoga but they end up at different goals oh, you know? yes, right. because they say each religious tradition says that you can attain however they conceive of as the ultimate goal of spiritual practice through doing yoga that is that, that's really fascinating the fact that it, it's kind of it's kind of sort of been steered in loads of different directions depending on sort of the language and the and the and the kingdom and the era um which is like the sufi one really is 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 kind of makes a lot of sense for me because as, as somebody who understands a little bit about sufis and, and what they do it would make a lot of sense um just in the sequence of events um the 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 roots of yoga book that you've um worked on with your colleague is that some of the stuff that you cover in it yes yeah i mean we well it's a it's a broader you know it's it's a much broader it's got a much broader approach than uh, the project i'm working on uh, in that we you know we try to cover yoga as a whole really because in the, in the project i'm i'm working on we're looking at the more recent manifestations, as I say, over the last thousand years, and in particular focusing on physical practice, you know, in part because of the phenomenon that is global yoga now, you know, I'm sure that was not not, uh, not an inconsiderable factor in the fact that we managed to get funding because of that focus of the project. But in the Roots of Yoga, with the book I did with Mark Singleton, we're looking at the, the broader history of yoga, you know, from the very beginnings, mm. probably 1000 BC or so, <clears throat> up to well up to not up to modernity up to around 1800 or probably mid 19th century is the latest text but we it's thematic and we look at all the different aspects of yoga practice so there'll be one you know there's a chapter on the understandings of the yogic body there's a chapter on breath control a chapter on meditation a chapter on postures and so forth and then in each chapter we have an introduction you know giving a brief overview of that of the historical development of that practice uh, and then the bulk of the chapter is translations from relevant texts. And I think we have translations from about 160 different texts. It was a big job. Basically, we started work on it quite a long time ago before this current project started, which is why it mm-hmm. didn't appear until halfway through the project. So some of our project work did feed into it. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <coughs> I, I want to ask about your sort of your your personal experience with yoga. Um, because you mentioned that you've spent a lot of time with the the sort of yogis who are very spiritual and and sort of segregated from worldly matters um what what type of yoga did you or, or did you did you practice yoga or were you just an observer yeah i practiced yoga i think my very first since that first trip to india when i was 17 i that was i met an english hippie on the beach down in the you know, <laughs> south india and he he convinced me to start trying to do headstands and that's when I started but I then in 92 when I went that was the first time I went to one of these big festivals this Kumbh Mela festival and I met my guru there um, that's another very long story I need to write a book about this sometime and, uh, get it uh, down I, there, I, I mean I'll definitely read it <laughs> uh, that's I mean that's a funny story as well he's a, an amazing character very sad he died last year died in July last year yeah so until I didn't I hadn't cut my hair since then until uh, oh really yeah because that's the thing that the, the sect that i'm part of so i then got initiated into his sect and uh yeah when your guru dies you cut your hair off oh, um, hey. so he he was renowned famous for being a master of yoga not just you know not you know he, he did the postures he could do a few postures but also more kind of esoteric you know bizarre techniques you know to take take a while to explain you know, he was most famous for being able to suck liquids up his penis Okay, and that, oh, that sounds oh, wow. rather, rather strange. <laughs> I've written, well, that's a skill. <laughs> yeah, I've given uh, I've given sort of long lectures to in in I mean, Vienna. I remember very embarrassed. I got, you know I've, I've published a paper on this subject, and yeah, it's quite. If you're squeamish, don't don't read it. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that was that's probably what he was best known for. 
Um, but yeah, he was a master of various different yoga practices as well. And he, he taught me quite a bit, but also it's the whole lifestyle that goes with it. I mean, he, so he learned from his guru through spending seven years, you know, live basically serving on his guru 24 seven, mm -hmm. waiting, waiting on him, learning from him, but also learning exactly you know, how to live the life of the, of the yogi. Now that's why it's, you know, it's very different from what we, and yeah, another a big difference I think between traditional yoga transmission in India and what we see now in the West and in India, as I say, it's all, you know, manifesting everywhere. It's like, it would always be taught one on one, you know, maybe one on two, I guess, in some yeah, situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. guru, guru to disciple. Whereas there's now we see these big classes of, you know, 20, 30 people in a yoga studio that would never happen. You know, that's just not, not how it's done. So he, he learned his yoga, as I say, through living, waiting you know 24 7 on on his guru and learning directly like that and i spent yeah a lot of time in india when you added up it's probably 10 12 years and a lot of that was living with him yeah traveling around it was a fantastic time particularly in the night you know when i was doing my phd and my time was generally my own uh and prior to that as well early 90s i spent you know months and months long stretches of just traveling around india with him visiting pilgrimage sites, ashrams, monasteries, um, festivals, and, and so forth, and really getting an understanding of the life of the traditional kind of wandering yogi in, in India. Uh, I mean, I, I, I want to ask you um, a question, but I, I guess because you got into it quite early at the age of 17, it was, is it when you first sort of went over there? Um, but I suppose I can still ask, how, how much has it changed um, sort of the, your understanding or the way you just live everyday life, um, having had somebody who's essentially your, your yoga, uh, I mean, mentor or, or, or teacher, how has it changed how you live here in the West or how you sort of live your life? It's a good question. I think now, you know, I'm, you know, I've always kind of, occupied a liminal space in, in that I had never fully committed to that way of life mm -hmm. in India. You know, I'd always extract myself from it and come back and I'm married, I've got children and so forth. So, I, you know, I lived the, and especially now having had a university job for the last seven or eight years, yeah. you know, I spend most of my time answering bloody emails. That's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not part of the, the sadhu yogi life in India. Um, but you know, yeah, I'm vegetarian, uh, yeah, there are, you know, just the, yeah, I guess the sort of simple ways I live, you know, the way I wash, the way I, the way I eat, what I eat, uh, those kind of things, yeah, very much uh, influenced by, by what I learned um, from my guru in India, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, my life here is extremely different as well. From, yeah, of course, of yeah. course. Um, so what would you... Um, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's interested in, in, in yoga studies or, or, or learning about yoga? Well, it, learning about yoga, well, there's, you know, I can advertise SOAS. We've got, we've got a, we're one of the uh, very few universities in the world to have an MA in, in uh, yoga and meditation. Um, we've got a centre for yoga studies where we're constantly putting out lectures and so forth. I would, and, and we've now got a YouTube channel. So you can look at previous lectures there. Since the uh, lockdown, we've been doing quite a lot of online stuff. I would suggest to people to look at some of that stuff, follow, you know, have a look, perhaps my book, Roots of Yoga. If it's something you're interested in, yeah, you can. I mean, we're looking actually at SOAS into incorporating yoga studies a certain amount into undergraduate courses as well. Okay. Um, yeah, and then if you're really, really keen, I mean, there's, uh, in terms of, pursuing research uh, options I think as I said to a great I mean obviously knowing Sanskrit is pretty important but also some of these vernacular languages there are unstudied texts in some of the more read Persian Marathi uh, Canada Telugu some of these southern Indian languages as well there are some texts which are clearly important particularly for the early history of, of yoga that uh, I think will be very fruitful avenues for future research mm -hmm. um, yeah, in terms of if you know if you're not that far down the, the road, I think yeah, check out our Centre for Yoga Studies, the offerings we've got there, the MA we offer, uh, 
and also with summer school, obviously we're not doing it this year. Last year, because we started the Center for Yoga Studies in 2018, and last year we had a summer school, which was a great success, actually. We had 20, 25 people from around the world, and that, that went down. We had lots of great academics coming in and teaching mm -hmm. different aspects, and we go around, and we had some practical stuff, some practical demos. Um, we, and there's lots around SOAS in London, we've got, you know, the uh, British Museum, British Library, Welcome Institute, all these places got great collections of yoga manuscripts and so forth. So that was a nice way to go and get kind of hands-on understanding of the sort mm -hmm. of, uh, sources we work with. So that would be, yeah, actually I think, you know, if you're, hopefully next year we'll be able to do our, our, sum, our summer school. So I would really yeah. recommend that as a, as a good way of kind of getting a taste for, for yoga studies that's, that's open to everyone. And then that might you know, inspire you to go on and do an MA or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, where can people find you online? Online, well, we. I'm on Twitter as Jim Mallins, and I, I tend to promote stuff there mm -hmm. a bit. I'm not, I, you know, sort of a bit wary of social media. Facebook as well has its pros and its cons, and I don't look at it very often. But I know that our Centre for Yoga Studies, we do promote stuff uh, through Facebook and Instagram as well. Mm -hmm. we're, on, we're on Instagram. Are oh, you on Instagram as well? So I'll. I'll, I'll what I'll do is I'll connect, I'll provide a link to, to all of these on, on the videos and on the... Yeah, and my project is called the, the Hatha Yoga Project, and that's got a website as well. So I think it's uh, If you can, yeah, I'll, I'll link that in. Well, just send that over to me and I'll link that into the, okay. to the show as well. Um, sure. Jim, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I've really enjoyed Thanks, it. Thanks, um, yeah, That was great. I think, I think it's going to be a fantastic episode that's going to, you know, loads of our audiences will be interested. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.